Hello everyone, we've got a special episode today so buckle up your butts. On this channel we feature decks with one commander and decks with two commanders, but today we attempt the impossible decks with three commanders. Now there is one slight issue, you're not allowed to make a deck with three commanders, but you can get pretty close if you build a partner deck and you have a companion. I wanted to make this video when Companions first came out, but back then we didn't have enough partners to really make the video interesting. There were a lot of Companions that you couldn't match up with a partner pair because of their restrictions, and the ones that you could match up only had like one or two options. But since then we've gotten Partner with Commanders, Monocolored Partners, Friends Forever Commanders, Background Commanders, and this random dog. So now every Companion that you're actually allowed to use can be matched up with two Commanders to make a triple Commander deck. So I'm going to be talking about the 100% factual, strictly best pair of partners to pair up with each of these prehistoric pals. And I'll also go over some honorable mentions for each one. As you can imagine, this video took a long time to research and I maybe went a tiny bit insane making my notes for this one, so if you appreciate the content then make sure to like and subscribe or check out my Patreon if you want to support me directly. It really helps a lot. Now without further ado, let's get started. We're gonna go in alphabetical order for the companions, so first off we have Garuda. Garuda lets us mill everybody for 4 when she ETBs, and then we can reanimate an even CMC creature from the milled cards. Her companion restriction is that we have to have an all even deck. So we're gonna need two commanders and the Demir colors that both have an even CMC. Starting with the partners, we can pair up any even blue partner with any even black partner. We don't have any even Demir partners, so that's not really an option. There aren't any partner with pairings that can work, so we don't even have to consider those. There are some Friends Forever pairs that would let us play Garuda, but none of them have any creature or graveyard synergies, so this doesn't really seem like a good option. And as far as backgrounds go, almost all the background commanders seemed really bad here. Most of them cared about random stuff like dungeons or dragons or party, and hardly had any synergy with Garuda at all. So the undisputed best commanders to play with your Garuda deck are Tormod the Desecrator and Sakashima the Imposter. Sakashima was pretty obviously one of the best options because she takes away the legend rule for your permanence. And anyone who's seen Garuda in a 60 card format knows that the most powerful thing to do with her is fill your deck with clones. Most clones happen to be even CMC, and if your deck is full of clones, then you can play Garuda, and then reanimate a clone to clone Garuda and keep the reanimation chain going. If you have normal clones, then they'll die to the legend rule, but if you have a clone like Sakashima or Spark Double, then you can get around the legend rule and start making a huge Garuda army. I think Tormod is also a pretty sweet commander here, because he makes a 2-2 zombie whenever a card leaves your graveyard. Garuda will do a great job of filling your graveyard, and every time you reanimate something, you'll get a free zombie token. You can lean pretty hard into the self-mill plan and put in cards like Narc Amoeba, Dread, and Guile. Oh, oh, sorry, I meant Guile. Dread and Guile both shuffle into your deck when they get milled, so they'll get you free zombie tokens from Tormod. And you can still reanimate them with Garuda because Garuda's ability is... weird. But yeah, the overall game plan for this deck seems pretty straightforward. Fill your deck with reanimation, chonkers, and clones. Then you can clone Garuda, Garuda chonkers, or reanimate chonkers and clone them instead. Now for our honorable mentions. While Tormod and Sakashima are definitely the two most on-theme options, you could replace Sakashima with Thrasios or Ishai if you want to have a third color. Having white gives you access to flicker cards to flicker Garuda and also some more reanimation, while green is... green, so it's... good. Losing Sakashima definitely makes it harder to assemble a Garuda army, but you can still put Sakashima in your deck and maybe just throw in some more tutors to find her. But yeah, personally, I think Tormod and Sakashima are definitely the best pair to go with. Commander number 2 on our list is Gigantha the Wellspring. This was actually one of the easiest companions to find a commander pairing for because there is literally only one option. Because of Gigantha's activated ability, we can only put him in a 5 color deck, and it turns out there is only one pair of commanders that gives us access to all 5 colors. We're forced to play Othelm, Sigardian Outcast, and Cecily Haunted Mage, so this partner pair just kinda wins by default. By default! My favorite, by way, default! To win! My favorite way to win! This deck will probably be the most good stuffy good stuff pile ever, so feel free to just jam whatever cards you want. 
Angel wants you to play creatures, and Cecily wants you to play instants and sorceries, so you can throw in cards like Conflux, Maelstrom Archangel, Worst Fears, Omnath, Kenrith, literally anything is fair game as long as it follows Gigantha's mana cost restriction. Take your favorite bombs and just smash them all together. Now for companion number 3, Kahira the Orphan Guard. Kahira buffs all your cats, elementals, nightmares, dinosaurs, and beasts, and she says that all of your creatures have to be cats, elementals, nightmares, dinosaurs, or beasts. Weirdly enough, Kahira was also super easy to find the best pairing for because, once again, there's literally one option. If I had a nickel for every time that happened... I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? If we want to build a partner deck with Kahira, we have to play Anara, Wolvid, Familiar, and Prava of the Steel Legion. Now while this is indisputably the best partner pairing, I am not at all convinced that an Anara Prava Kahira deck would actually be good. <laughs> I'm not really sure what your game plan would be, and there's hardly any synergy between these three cards. In fact, since Prava just makes soldier tokens, the tokens don't even get buffed by Kahira's Anthem effect, which is almost hilariously bad. But if you do want to build this deck for some reason, then my advice would be to just fill your deck with non-creature cards that make tokens and a bunch of wraths. That way you won't have to worry about Kahira's restriction too much and your commanders will survive the wraths. You can just spam tokens and wrath over and over until your opponents lose the will to keep playing. Yeah, let's move on to a deck that actually makes sense. Next up is Karuga the Macro Sage. This guy forces you to only play Chonkers in your deck, and by Chonkers I mean cards with at least 3 CMC. Now it turns out that the vast majority of partners, friends, and backgrounds cost at least 3 mana, so you can take just about any combination of a blue and green commander and then just add Karuga to it. Let's start with the honorable mentions first this time because we have a lot of options to go through. There's one partner pairing that might seem like the obvious choice for a Karuga deck, and while these two partners do synergize really well, I don't actually think they're the best choice. Galanra, Collar of Wirewood, and Brineland the Moon Kraken are two partners that both care about playing cards that cost at least 6 mana. This seems like a great match for Karuga, who wants you to play only cards that cost at least 3, but I think that this is actually more of a nonbo than a combo. If you're playing a deck with a bunch of 6 drops, you need to fill your deck with as much cheap ramp as possible. I think that taking out all of your 1 and 2 mana ramp just so you can play Karuga would honestly make this deck a lot worse. Another option to consider here was Peer and Toothy. Peer and Toothy decks tend to care about two things, counters and card draw, so Karuga seems like a decent fit in this deck as well. But after looking it over, I'm not convinced that Karuga really adds anything to a Peer and Toothy deck. Those decks tend to be filled with ways to draw a bunch of cards already, so I don't think you'll ever be wanting to pay 8 mana for a Karuga that probably just draws a couple cards when you could be playing a Commander's Insight or Blue Sun Zenith or something like that. Adding mediocre card draw to a deck that's already full of card draw just doesn't seem necessary. The last honorable mention I found was Kaidel with Elegith. These commanders do pair pretty well with Karuga because Elegith draws you a bunch of cards, which lets Kaidel make a bunch of mana, and that gives you enough mana to actually play your Karuga and then draw a couple more cards and wombo combo value town the whole table. The downside of having to spend so much mana on Karuga isn't as bad when you have a commander that taps for a bunch of colorless mana. The main reason I didn't go with this partner pairing was that most of the best scry cards are actually 1 or 2 mana. If you're playing Elegith, then you really want to have access to Preordain, Serum Visions, Mystic Speculation, and other cheap cantrips. And I don't think getting rid of those is worth adding Karuga to your deck. So that finally leaves us with my number one pick. The best two commanders to play with a Karuga companion are Vol, Candlekeep Researcher, and Raised by Giants. Vol taps for mana equal to her toughness, but we can't use that mana to play spells from our hand, and Raised by Giants makes our Vol into a 10-10. This commander pair is actually pretty nuts. It's pretty easy to find ways to use Vol's mana, even though the restriction on it sounds really restrictive. The best way is with Basalt Monolith. We can use Vol's mana to untap the monolith, and then tap the monolith for 3 normal mana, so if we have a Basalt Monolith, then Vol's mana restriction basically just goes away. And we can always tap her the turn after we play her to just pay 3 mana and put Karuga into our hand. You can also use Vol's mana to help pay for the Raised by Giants, because it's in the command zone and not your hand. 
Once you get your vault combos online and you start making crazy amounts of mana, Karuga will be a great backup plan to make sure you have enough card draw to pop off. I think he really strengthens the deck, and most of the best cards to use with Vol cost at least 3 mana anyway, so running Karuga doesn't actually hurt you that much here. Since this deck seems really really good at making a ton of mana, making sure you have access to card draw that isn't super amazing is actually very beneficial. We're going from a chonky McChonkerson deck to the weeniest of weenies, because next up is Luris of the Dream Den. Luris lets you replay cheap permanents from your graveyard, but she only lets you put permanents in your deck that cost 2 or less mana. This companion was an absolute terror in 60 card formats. It was the first normal magic card to be full on banned in vintage... ever. In case that didn't sink in, this 3 mana 3 2 was banned in a format where you're allowed to play Black Lotus. It was unbanned after the rules for companions changed, but it continued to terrorize modern players as it was still so good in modern that like a third of decks were playing it. It eventually got banned in modern too after players got fed up with seeing Alluris staring them down at the start of what felt like every single game. Everywhere I go, I see his face. So now that the dust has settled, the only paper formats that Alluris is legal in are Vintage and Commander which, assuming you aren't Jeff Bezos, means the only place you can actually play Alluris is Commander. Long story short, I know that building a deck with only permanents that cost 2 or less sounds kinda ridiculous, but Commander is the only place where you can play this guy as a companion, so we're gonna try really hard to make that happen. Since almost all the Commanders we have to pick from cost 3 or more mana, we have very few options this time to pick from. We can go with Wernog and Bjorna, or we can pair up Miara Thorn of the Glade with Akiri, Keleth, Livio, or Yoshimaru. Now before we get to my favorite pick, I will preface this by saying that if you wanted to build the most competitive CEDH deck possible, then you should probably go with Wernog and Bjorna. But I'm not a huge fan of this option because it honestly seems like you're only using them to get access to four colors. You could try and build around the artifact synergies a bit, but from what I've seen, these decks tend to just be a pile of CDH staples that are good with Luris, and I don't think Thoracling people should really be the goal here. So if you want to build a normal power level Luris deck, then the best option is Miara and Akiri. Now these commanders probably look like they don't synergize with each other at all, and that's because they don't. I didn't think it was possible to build a cohesive deck with artifacts and elves, especially because we're in Mardu, so we can't play any green elves. But I can 100% guarantee you that you can make a cohesive deck around Miara, Akiri, and Luris, because I actually did. Mad lad! Mad lad! I built this deck in real life, and it's not only one of my most powerful decks, it's also super fun to play. The theme of the deck is aristocrats with some elves and also some random artifacts and equipment. I know this deck sounds really dumb, but I promise it actually works. There are a surprising number of elves you can play in Mardu Colors, like Elder Fang Disciple, Thornbow Archer, or Commander All-Star Devoted Hero, who is actually an elf, even though it doesn't say it on the card. None of these elves really do anything, but that doesn't matter. You just spam elves and sacrifice them to draw cards with Miara. Then you eventually draw into something like Living Death to bring back all your elves and then play random aristocrat creatures to drain people out. Remember that Luris only says our permanents have to cost 2 or less, so we can still play all the good mass reanimation staples. Now Akiri might not seem super relevant to this deck, but we're getting to that. If you want this deck to be competitive, then you're going to need Skull Clamp, and a bunch of ways to find your Skull Clamp. If you're running cards like Stoneforge Mystic and Steel Shaper's Gift anyway, then you might as well throw in other equipment to get just in case. Add in some treasure generators, mana rocks, and random utility artifacts, and Akiri will actually get up to a pretty decent size surprisingly quick. Getting in some early damage with Akiri makes it a lot easier to drain people out and finish them off. Now I'm not going to go over my entire deck list because I might make a video about this deck in the future, but if you feel like a fun deck building challenge, then I highly recommend building this deck. We are halfway through our 10 companions, so we're going to take a quick break for something that we haven't done in quite a while. That's right, it's trivia time. 
While the 10 companions from Ikoria are definitely the most iconic, there are actually a bunch of other companions that came before them in Magic. So today's question for a whopping 3.5 tofu points is... Name any card in Magic with the word companion in its name. There are 15 in total, but only 4 of them are cards that anyone will probably recognize. Stay tuned till the end if you want the answer. Now back to the video. Our next companion is Lutri the Spellchaser. This one was really easy because Lutri's just banned. Lutri's restriction is that you have a singleton deck, which in Commander isn't actually a restriction, so Lutri was banned from Commander before he was ever even printed. Up next is Obosh the Prey Piercer. Obosh doubles all of our damage from odd sources and makes us play only odd CMC cards. This restriction isn't too bad, so there are a ton of options for our commander pair. There aren't any partner with or friends forever pairs we can use, but we can play any red and black odd partner, or we can play Vile Smasher with just any odd partner. And there are also a couple of background pairs that would work. Now while there are some interesting honorable mentions that we will get to later, I think it's pretty obvious that Vile Smasher synergizes way too well with Obosh to not be one of the best partners for him. Vile Smasher just throws around random damage when we play spells each turn, and doubling that up is a perfect way to burn people out. As for the other partner, I thought it would be a really good idea to try and find a blue one, because if we make a deck with a lot of instants in it, then we'll be able to trigger Vile Smasher on everybody's turn instead of just our turn. I think the best option is definitely Krom Ludovic's Opus. It's blue-red, and it draws us some cards, which is really nice. But it's also just a 4-4 with flying and haste. If you have Obosh out, then this guy just smacks people for 8 in the air, which is kind of nuts. And this deck is pretty easy to build, just, just play Grixis, just play your favorite Grixis cards. You can go in a more controlling direction, or a more burn direction, you can literally just do whatever you want. Now for our honorable mentions. Like I said, Vile Smasher is so good that the only question really is which partner you want to pair up with Vile Smasher. Tago and Jessica are both really good alternatives to Krom if you want to cut blue and go with a more hyper aggro Rakdos deck. Ludovic is also a consideration, but I didn't like him as much as Krom because he lets everybody draw cards when other people take damage, and with all the random damage you'll be dealing, there's a decent chance that Ludovic will basically just be a Howling Mine and not give you any card advantage over your opponents. But if you think Vile Smasher is way too mainstream, then we do have one more hipster option, which is Carlock Fury of Avernus with Cultist of the Absolute. Carlock gives you an extra combat phase, and Cultist gives your commander plus 3 plus 3 in flying, along with a bunch of other stuff, although it does make you sack a creature each turn. I think this pairing is good enough to make the list based solely on the fact that if you play Obosh, Carlock, and the Cultist, then you can just one-shot people in the air. Your Carlock will be an 8-8 with flying, that deals double damage, and gives you an extra combat phase, so that adds up to 32 commander damage in one turn. I'm not sure exactly how strong this is, because it does take 14 mana in total to get everything going, but having access to a one-shot kill at the start of every game seems kinda hilarious. We are closing in on the end here with our 8th companion, Umori the Collector. Umori just says that all of our cards have to be the same type, and he makes all of our spells cost one less. Umori was by far the most difficult companion to solve. He has the most options available because all we have to do is pick two commanders that are the same type, and since almost all of them are creatures, we have a very wide variety of choices. Most of the Friends Forever cards synergize with artifacts or instants and sorceries, so I decided not to go with them. And we can't use a background pairing, because backgrounds always have one creature and one enchantment. Unless you want to play Faceless One, but no. The biggest problem with Umori is that all he does is make our spells cost one less, which is nice, but isn't really that good? Especially when you consider that it costs 7 total mana to get Umori onto the board. Umori tends to work best in artifact decks, because if you play cheap artifacts, then you can get them to be free with enough cost reduction. But sadly, we can't build an artifact deck because there aren't any green partner commanders that are artifact creatures. But I found something that's almost as good, maybe. We have two main challenges with this deck. We need a deck where making our spells cost one less is actually an important part of the game plan. 
and the deck can only have creatures in it. There is only one possibility for a deck like that, and it's Creature Storm. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. But not just any Creature Storm. For our commanders, we're going to go with Nakara Lair Scavenger and Yannick Scavenging Sentinel. Nakara lets us draw a card if one of our creatures leaves the battlefield and I had a counter on it. And Yannick lets us O-ring our own creatures to distribute some counters. So Nakara is going to serve as our draw engine, but we are going to have to find a way to put plus one plus one counters on our creatures, and Yannick can help us with that a little bit in a pinch. Let's take a closer look at our game plan here. We're going to need three things, a cost reducer, a bunch of creatures we can play for free that also have counters on them, and payoffs. Umori is obviously going to be our main cost reducer here, but we should have some backups. We can use cards like Hamza, Mycosynth Golem, or Nylea Keen-Eyed. Since our deck is going to have a ton of artifact creatures and creatures with plus one plus one counters, Hamza and the Golem should be pretty cheap to get onto the board. Next up, we need our free creatures. Creatures like Arcbound Worker, Clockwork Beetle, and Endless One are some of our best choices here because we can play them for free with Umori, and they already come with a plus one plus one counter. But we're going to need more than that, so we'll have to run some generic 1 mana artifact creatures that don't come with a counter too. Now we can make up for that by playing cards like Anafenza, Good Fortune Unicorn, or Juniper Order Ranger. All of these cards will make sure that every free creature we play will get a plus one plus one counter. And the last piece of our puzzle here is our payoffs. We have a lot of options for this one. There are tons of cards that trigger off of creatures ETBing or dying, like Grim Harrispex, Soul of the Harvest and his Goth Girlfriend, or Pawn of Ulamog. But since we're trying to get plus one plus encounters on all of our creatures, that actually opens up a bunch of other payoff options that specifically care about creatures with counters on them, like Embros, Felisa, and Rishkar. I guess we'll also need some sack outlets as well, but the usual suspects should do the job pretty nicely. Now I'm not going to pretend like this deck isn't janky, because it is undeniably incredibly janky. And I'm also not sure if it's the quote unquote best triple commander deck you can make with Umori in the sense that there's probably a more competitive build out there. But I do think this is the best triple commander Umori deck that actually uses Umori. Like sure, if you just picked Timna and Thrasios and filled your deck with two card creature combos and then stuck a Umori on it, that deck would probably be better than the one I just described. But is that really an Umori deck? Or just a combo deck that you made worse just so you could say you're technically playing Umori, even though you're never going to cast it? Like I said before, Umori just kind of sucks. In my opinion, he's the worst companion by far, having one of the strictest deck building restrictions combined with one of the least impressive abilities. But I think that this deck actually does a decent job of utilizing him to his full potential. Now we do have some honorable mentions as well. You could try playing Iktekic and Ashai and build a Golem Tribal deck, or Othelm and Wurnog for a generic creature good stuff deck, or Kazura and Ukima for an evasive aggro deck. But none of those decks take advantage of Umori nearly as much as plus one plus one counter Creature Storm does. Our penultimate companion is Yorion Sky Nomad. This one was really fast because it's also banned. You're banned! But it's weird that it happened twice, right? Well, it's technically not banned, but it's impossible to play it as your companion because you'd have to build a 120 card deck, which is against the rules. So that brings us to our final companion, Zerda the Dawn Waker. Zerda reduces our activated abilities by 2, but doesn't make them free. And she only lets us put permanent cards with activated abilities into our deck. Also, we can pay 1 and tap her to stop a creature from blocking. There are no backgrounds with activated abilities, so we can't use a background pair. But there are a decent amount of options from the other ones. Our first honorable mention is the friend pair Bjorna and Hargild. Neither of these commanders actually synergize directly with Zerda because their abilities don't get cheaper, but they both want us to play artifacts, and Hargild specifically wants us to play artifacts with activated abilities, so we could maybe build a cool artifact deck with Zerda. Our second honorable mention is Prava and Elena. Prava just seems really powerful if we can make her ability only cost 2, but I, I don't think it's really worth reworking your whole deck just to get Zerda in. So our pick for the best partner pair is Braylon Skyshark Rider and Shabraz the Skyshark. 
Braylon and Shabraz get bigger when we draw and discard cards, and they both have an activated ability that buffs the other one in combat. Zerda works super well in Braylon Shabraz decks for three reasons. One, these decks tend to run a bunch of wheels, and most wheel effects are instants or sorceries, so Zerda doesn't actually care about them. There are some wheel effects that are on permanent cards, but they're almost all on creatures with activated abilities, so it's really easy to fit a Zerda into this deck. Two, Zerda makes cycling cheaper. Cycling is a cheap way to get some extra draws and discards, so we'll want to put in a cycling sub-theme with cards like Nimble Obstructionist, Shark Typhoon, and Yadaro. Remember, cycling is an activated ability, so those cards do still work with Zerda. And we can also play some of the cycling payoffs as long as they have an activated ability, like Astral Drift, or they're not a permanent, like Zenith Flare. And reason number three, Zerda's activated ability is actually a little bit relevant in this deck. When you play a Braylon and Shabraz deck, your commanders tend to get really big really fast, so getting rid of blockers is surprisingly useful. Especially since your commanders can both fly, kind of, so if your opponent only has one flying blocker, then Zerda can let you smash in for huge amounts of damage. This triple commander pair really seems like a perfect match. The only really big cuts you might have to make from your Braylon and Shabraz deck to make Zerda fit are Curiosity and Aphidian Eye. Both of these cards let you combo people out with Braylon, but it might be for the best to cut these cards anyway if you don't want your deck to get archenemy blacklisted. In fact, if you think about it, running Zerda might make your politics better, because you can tell people you're not playing Curiosity and Aphidian Eye, and they actually know you're telling the truth because you aren't allowed to put them in your Zerda deck. And with that, we are finally done. We have found the 100% best commander pair to play with every single companion in Commander. Oh, but before we finish, here are the answers to the trivia question. The 15 cards with companion in their name are Bear Companion, Cathar's Companion, Companion of the Trials, Garrick's Companion, Initiate's Companion, Myla Crafty Companion, Mowu Loyal Companion, Raptor Companion, Searchlight Companion, Shu Elite Companion, Sojourner's Companion, Spirited Companion, Sworn Companions, Trusty Companion, and Way Elite Companions. How many of those did you find? And do you agree with our commander list, or are there any commander pairings that you think are better that I missed? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. Tofu out.